Where have I been the last eight months? It's been a while. I haven't stopped talking about these things. I just stopped doing the podcast. The last one that was posted was a recording of a meeting. And I've got several more of those recordings coming out ready to go. Why am I back? I realize that I have a whole lot less free time now as of about three weeks ago. And so it's helped me to cut out a whole bunch of fluff that was there. So even though I have less time to do this than ever, I'm realizing how important and key it is. Now, how did I realize that or was reminded of that? I have to give a shout out to Dylan. Dylan had some very kind words about the podcast and how it's been helpful for him in some very, very deep ways. Dylan, you and Mallory are the reason that I do this. Your response to hearing the law being taught and the attitude that that, that you're going to carry forward because of that, that's the reason that I do this. That's why the whole new covenant was given in the first place. And so now that you have experienced that response, you have an unfathomably dangerously high responsibility. Jesus said that he who wishes to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven must be the one who does the law and teaches the law. And so I, on my path to be the greatest in heaven, I have to take this path. And what's nice about this path is it becomes very clear when you start talking about the law that it is a two-edged sword and it shows me exactly who I need to spend more time with and who is a relatively useless relationship. I want my relationships to be with those who love God. You can email me at theocrat at gmail.com that's t-h-e-e-o-c-r-a-t at gmail.com my interview today is with john diamond i met john about 11 months ago at a film festival in franklin tennessee i've been attending that festival for probably seven years now He and I hit it off really well. We had lunch together, and I decided I'd reach out to him and ask him to be on the show. He uh, is on the same page on a lot of things, not to the full extent that I would be, but more than most. He has a few courses that teach uh, American history, the value of the Constitution, and he's just an all-around very knowledgeable guy, and I think you need to give him some of your attention. Enjoy my interview with John. Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. See, I have taught you statutes and rules, as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. Who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? My name's Adam Terrell, and I'm here to encourage you to obey the law and think about it and speak about it constantly. I broke the law. Christ paid my debt by sacrificing himself so that I can be clean to offer myself as a living sacrifice back to God. The entire Mosaic law is obligatory for everyone. Keeping some of the laws look different today because the light of further revelation supersedes shadows in the old law. The temple sacrifices are an example where we have something better. Note that we must still obey the Mosaic laws for sacrifices. There is still a temple, and priests are still required to offer sacrifices. It's just that the priests, the sacrifices, and the temple are all better now. 
God will show grace to those who apply the law to themselves, to those who have hidden the law in their hearts, and he will judge those who disobey accordingly. I must apply it to myself, and then those around me will see its fruit and be drawn to its goodness. Theocracy grows by the sword of the Spirit, God's word, and self-sacrifice. The law's purpose is to give a path to restoration. Christ has restored me, so I must seek to restore others by sacrificing myself. Thanks for listening. My goal with each conversation is to edify and bring the law and wisdom to bear on each person's current situation in life. Let's jump into this week's interview. I guess when you want to start at the beginning, uh, I was born and raised in Columbus, Ohio. I was raised Catholic, uh, joined the United States Air Force uh, six days after I after I graduated high school, spent eight years in the military, uh, came out, was pretty much full-blown alcoholic. Um, my brother invited me to church when I was 27. I accepted Christ, uh, delivered from many number of things, including alcohol, drugs, cigarettes. Um, from that point on, um, started to go into Bible college. I uh, didn't really do too much politically um, until I think it was 2003. I went down and stood with Judge Roy Moore on the Ten Commandments uh, monument down there. I really just went down there just to see what was going on and uh, trying to understand both sides of it. And then when I came back, I started really what became a three-year uh, research project on a lot of the founding documents and the writings of the founding fathers and the Constitution and things like that. Uh, and that's what really got me. That's what really got me kind of fired up for uh, the restoration of this nation. So, how did you first hear about the Judge Roy Moore thing about the Ten Commandments? That was in uh, Missouri, right? That was down in um, Alabama. Alabama. Yeah, no, it was all. Yeah, it was all over all the news, CNN, Fox News. It was. It was pretty much all over everything. And I had just graduated Bible college. Um, and I was between my my bachelor's and my master's, so I was following the story pretty closely. And then uh, somebody put out a call to come down there and stand with them. So I took some vacation, went down there just for about three or four days, just to just to see what was going on and and get a feel for it. I would go back to the hotel room at night and watch CNN and Fox and just kind of see how everybody would spin the story in their own. Uh, in their own direction. And that's what started it for me. And I went home, I went home after that, figured both sides had an agenda. So I just tried to do a kind of uh, independent study uh, to find out if, if either side was right and, and which ones were actually talking about what the constitution really intended. So when you went down there, you weren't fully expecting to either fully agree or disagree. You just wanted to get more details for yourself. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. I went down there just to just to kind of get a feel for the whole the whole situation, um, talk to the people firsthand because I already knew that the media was slanted. I mean, every you know, media is made up of, of of people, and people have agendas, and people have worldviews and opinions. And I wanted to go down there and kind of just get a feel for it for myself. So it was kind of amazing when I would go back to the hotel room about ten o'clock at night and just watch the various news coverages, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, and just watch how they kind of spun the story that I witnessed firsthand throughout the day. Were you afraid to go down there, or was it a, f a friend of yours or something in your upbringing that made you more interested in that politically, more charged, religious type stuff? No, I, like I said, I had just graduated from Bible college, so I got, like I said, saved at 27 and then spent four years in Bible college and, um, you know, Inter as a Christian, interested in God's law and, and you know the 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 relationship between America and and uh, uh, God's law. Uh, Judge Moore started an organization called um, uh, the Mor about moral foundation, the moral foundation for the American system of government. So that's what I wanted to that's what I wanted to research myself was exactly what the founding fathers intended uh, in, in that relationship between uh, religion and politics or government. So when you went down there, did you have a, an epiphany, or did it just sort of slowly turn you to a to a long term trajectory that you've been on ever since? Yeah, it was it was long term for sure. Um, when I went down there, like I said, I came back um, and I heard both sides both given their opinion of what the Constitution said and what the founding fathers intended. Um, so that's when I just like I said, I was between my bachelor's and my master. I wasn't working on anything. So I mean, I went out and I bought. First, I read all the founding documents. were pretty easy to find online. Constitution, Declaration of Independence, Federalist Papers, Anti-Federalist Papers, uh, Journal of the Constitutional Convention. Uh, those those were e pretty easy to find. And then I went back 
Um, and, and I got on eBay. I went to old dusty libraries. Um, and I started to find uh, textbooks that were written. I think the earliest one I found was 1889. Um, and wow. I tried to find everything right before World War II. So I had a I had a stack of about 30 or 40 history books, uh, textbooks from that era. Um, and I come to find out that, you know, what we're being told today has probably much been a sanitized, sanitized version of history. So can you get into any specifics of that? Like what things have been sanitized or lost, so to speak? Well, the, the main issue is the, the twisting of uh, the First Amendment. Um, you know, we've had we had Bible and prayer in the school from the time the Mayflower landed all the way to the early 1960s. So you're looking at, you know, 340 years uh, where that tradition went, you know, uh, unscathed. And now all of a sudden the Supreme Court's going to find something in the First Amendment that says, you know, that the founding fathers intended to be this fictitious separation of church and state. And if you read the First Amendment, it says no such thing. It says Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So when they when they uh, made their ruling and, and banned prayer and and the Bible from schools, you know, trying to enforce the establishment clause, they actually violated the free exercise clause. And, and that's that's unconstitutional in itself. Yeah, even going, I think, all the way back to Jamestown, there was something called I think it's the Ye Old Deluder Satan Act or something along those lines. Are you familiar with that? I've heard of it, yeah. If you, I got a. Uh, there's a great author, a friend of mine named uh, William Federer. Um, he he goes back and he's got man just tons and tons of books on really everything from American history. Uh, and he goes back. I think he's got one called the Original Thirteen. And if you actually look at the Constitution of the Original Thirteen States, um, right about 1776. I mean, it's just amazing. You couldn't even be a. You couldn't even hold up a political office unless you made some very uh, very strongly uh, worded beliefs. You had to believe in the the, the uh, uh, old New, the New Testament. You, you had to be a member of the Protestant religion. It was it was pretty uh, <laughs> it was a pretty strict thing compared to what we see today. Right. A lot of people like to argue that well, there's God's not mentioned in the Constitution, so it's a, it's the godless Constitution. But when you look in the individual state constitutions, yeah, there's all kinds of requirements about, like, you have to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I, I think that's in at least one of them, isn't that right? Yeah, I do believe so. Yeah, and, and that's what they have to understand about the Constitution. The, and, and this is what I did on a, um, a radio podcast that I did for Dr. Mike Spaulding here recently, um, I go back to the Declaration of Independence because we've separated the Declaration of Independence from the Constitution. The, the Constitution has just created the framework of the federal government. That was it. Um, if you want to go back to find out what they actually believed, you got to go to the Declaration of Independence. That's what I call the American Statement of Faith. Um, just because they don't mention anything about religion in the Constitution, you can't make that argument from absence, so to speak. I mean, you know, I have a mortgage, I have a lease payment, I have a military contract, uh, none of which mention God in them. But that that doesn't that doesn't mean that I don't have any faith just because these contracts that I've signed, you know, don't have any mention of it. And it's the same with the Constitution. It was not created. It was created to basically create the government and then put certain restrictions on the government. It wasn't the American statement of faith. That's the Declaration of Independence. And I think as a nation, if we if we're going to um, kind of unify the American people. It has to be around the core ideas of the Declaration of Independence and, and just understand that, that that document was later protected by the, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Yeah, very interesting. So you, you designed a course. Tell me about the entire course. It's the, the Teach Americanism course? Yeah, it's called, uh, uh, we're in the process of working on it now. We got the first video filmed. It's called Americanism, A Course in Citizenship and Ethics. Um, it's been about a 15 year project. Uh, what, it, what ended up happening was um, after, after I wrote my first book back in 2003, after leaving Judge Moore's um, rally there, I spent about 10 years trying to get the, the church to wake up and become you know, politically active, help them to understand what, what their role, what their function is in society. And um, 10 years, nothing. I mean, they just weren't very interested. So one day, one day I kind of just hung it up, so to speak. And I was just like, I'm done. That's it. And the Lord was like, write down every lie that you've heard come out of the mouth of a pastor. So, um, I just sat down and I wrote down 10 right off the top of my head. Some of the same excuses that we hear, you know, for why Christians are not supposed to be involved in the affairs of government. Um, and then it turned into 12. So I taught that, 
um, it, it, on Sunday morning in my class, and then I taught it on Sunday night to the entire congregation, and then we decided just to turn it into a turn it into a video series. What would you say is the number one objection or lie that you hear from coming from the pulpits? The biggest one is is the very first video, and that's why we did it. Uh, is is the misunderstanding or misunder uh, misinterpretation of Romans thirteen? Because I, I hear a lot of pastors say, you know, hey. You know, the Bible says that we have to obey the government. As a matter of fact, when I first started the Appeal to Heaven book and the Appeal to Heaven project, uh, one of the advisors was like, well, one, one of my mentors told me to, to be careful, you know, about opposing the government because of what the Bible says, um, specifically Romans 13. And I said, well, I hope your buddy's a theologian because most of what I hear coming out of the, the pulpit today is the exact opposite of what Romans 13 teaches. Um, so once I, once I set him straight and I showed him what, Romans 13 taught and then showed how that was applied from Genesis to Revelation, he immediately said, okay, I'm on board. And then that's when we started the Appeal to Heaven project. So what's the specific argument from Romans 13 that people make, and how do you respond to it? Well, if you look at, I think you can even go back to like the original um, the original uh, King James Version, and that's why King James actually, uh, one of the reasons he wrote the, the King James Version was because he believed in what they call the divine right of kings, that God put government in its place, and for that reason, um, everybody has to obey the government, because if you rebel against the government, your, government you're creating really a sacrilegious act, uh, and, and by doing so, you're rebelling against God. Um, and, I, and I think it even says it in the heading, if you got an original, I'm talking 1611 New King James, it actually says something to the fact that citizens obey your government. And that's not what Romans 13, it doesn't have the word citizens, it doesn't have the word government. Um, if you look at Romans 13, it's very clear. Let every soul, who is every soul? Every soul. Kings, presidents, justices, let every soul subject to the, uh, be subject to the higher authority, for there is no authority but of God. So as a veteran, when I read that, what I saw was a chain of command. God, government, citizens. All right. As long as government is acting as, as, as God's ministers, then Christians should obey the government. The question then becomes throughout history from Genesis on is what happens when, when the government leader gets so drunk with their own power that they begin rebelling against God. Um, and that's very easy to do. You can just I mean, you can go back to Pharaoh uh, telling the Hebrew midwives that they had to, to kill the, the, the babies as they were being born. And the Hebrew midwives re rejected that. Uh, you can go to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You can go to Daniel. You can go to Esther and Mordecai. You can go to the apostles when they were told not to preach the name of Christ by their government. You know, when government is in its place, uh, I, I think it was our founding fathers had a seal, and I got it in my book that says uh, disobedience to tyrants is obedience to God. Basically what happens when the government rebels against God or a government leader rebels against God um, the believer is put in a no-win situation. I can either follow the government leader into disobedience or I can obey God. It, when you're in a no-win situation, you just have to default to the highest authority. Who is the highest authority in the chain of command that ruled on this? Um, and that's what the Hebrew children did. You know, God said in the first two commandments, do not have no gods before me, do not worship any idols. Nebuchadnezzar passed a law basically telling them to do that. So they were put in a no-win situation. I can obey government or I can obey God. Well, that you're not doing anything wrong as a believer, <laughs> you know, I mean, they, they put you in that situation and God's not sitting in heaven going, well, you know, I created government, so you have to go ahead and, you know, worship that false statue. That It's just biblically ignorance uh, when people want to try to make those cases. I think that's so important today, uh, especially with, you know, all the injustice that you see around the world, right? We have the option, if obeying a bad law wouldn't necessarily be disobedience to God, then we can obey that law, and it's not necessarily a sin to do so. But I think it would have been a, a sin, like you said, for the Hebrew midwives to go and start killing all of the Hebrew babies. That would have been absolutely a sin, and nobody really disagrees with that, but then they can't, for whatever reason, translate that over into modern day. It's like a blind spot. Right, that's, that's the problem right there, is, I mean, we... Um, and I teach this quite a bit. The, the main, one of the main scriptures is do not be hearers of the word only, but be doers of the word. I mean, there's actually a Bible called the Life Application Bible. We're supposed to read that stuff, go in there on Sunday morning, find out what it says, but then we're supposed to apply it to our lives, to our governments, to our societies. And, and that's the problem is when people are not applying the truths and the lessons and the principles and the examples and the commandments and everything that we've been told, 
that that's where you that's where you have that disconnect. Um, but you can look. I mean, you can look throughout history. I, one of the greatest ones I love to use is the uh, Underground Railroad. You know, the Fugitive uh, Fugitive Slave Act said that you will return a, a slave to its to their master. And in God's word, it says not only will you not kidnap somebody um, and make him your slave, but the other side of it is people were commanded that if a slave escapes from his master, you are commanded by God to keep him from that from that slave owner. So. Um, they basically violated the abolitionists in the North were violating the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, that's civil disobedience, but they were obeying God. So they were put in that no win situation. And that, that happens throughout history. It's, it's something that we're getting ready, <laughs> something we're dealing with, uh, mightily right now with, with abortion laws, with, with the, all the gay rights stuff, you know, we're being put in a situation where we're going to have to obey God or, go, um, or obey the tyrant. And that, that's, I guess that's my main message right now. Um, to the American Christian churches, you you better you better find out what God says. You better understand who the highest authority is, um, because government does not have the right to legalize what God has said was illegal, and they don't have the right to forbid what He said was permissible. And, and that's stated right in the Declaration of Independence, if you understand it. So there's a lot of people that are really depressed seeing all those different things that you mentioned. What are some current bright spots that you see? Where are we? Where's the church winning right now? Is it anywhere? Yeah, well, they're starting to wake up, and I think it took all of this stuff to basically wake the church up. I mean, it's that kind of what I call incrementalism, you know, the frog being boiled in water, so to speak. I mean, before the 1960s, you look at America before 1960, and you look at it today, and it's an absolute 180-degree degree different society. Um, and and it, what happened is things just changed so incrementally, like the frog being boiled in water, people didn't see it. Um, and, it, and it's to the point now, one of the illustrations I use is turning up the volume on your TV. You know, if somebody turns it up from 24 to 25, you're not going to notice that difference. You know, and then you let your ears get adjusted, you go up to 26. You let your ears get adjusted, you go up to 27. Over a period of a half hour, you get up to 50. Well, pretty soon you're going to realize, hey, man, how'd this TV get so loud? You're not going to turn it back to 49. You're going to turn it all the way back down to where you were. And then that's what happened in America and um Everything just got changed so incrementally over a period of time. People are just like, what in the world happened? Um, so that's what you have to do. You have to go back. You can either just go back to the beginning and um, and see what the founding father said. Look at the court cases. Look at the rulings that they made on many of these issues. It's pretty cut and dry. But you could just go back before 1960. I mean, turn on TV land and look at a lot of the shows that were produced before 1960. You know, there's no gratuitous violence. There's no sex. There's no language. There's, <laughs> I mean, there's none of that stuff. Um, so... You know, Hollywood and the media have had a had a big role in kind of incrementally uh, turning this nation around, and it and it's the church's function to turn it back. There's a book that I had somebody recommended. It's called The View from Sunset Boulevard, and I think it was written by uh, Ben Stein. He did an analysis of all of the shows that were on television at the time, and he just noted that not a single sitcom or any kind of show on, I think this was in the 70s, maybe the 60s, there was not a nuclear family anywhere on television. Well, if you even look at, I think it was the Brady Bunch, I think was there was a major uproar in the late 60s, early 70s on the Brady Bunch. It was kind of one of the first bedroom scenes. They wouldn't even show bedroom scenes because, I mean, there's only two things happen in a bedroom and nobody should really be wanting to watch either. <laughs> it's boring to watch people sleep and the other is pornography. So, I mean, they didn't even show bedroom scenes. Uh, when it comes to husbands and wives or relationships before then. And I think the Brady Bunch was one of the first shows that actually um, had a had the Mike and Carol in, in, in the bedroom. And there was such a major uproar about that because they knew where it was trending. They knew what was going on. I mean, the bed was the size of a semi truck and they had like 80 layers of clothes on. <laughs> and, but I mean, people understood that once you entered into the bedroom, now they knew the clothes were going to start coming off. The bed was going to start shrinking. And, you know, now you got now you got soap operas or basically what, what would be considered soft porn when I was a young man. Yeah, even with the Dick Van Dyke show, they were in totally separate beds. They had there was bedroom stuff, but they never were actually in the same bed together. That's exactly right. So, I mean, people understood back then. I mean, <laughs> God created marriage. God created sex. It's all good. But, you know, it wasn't something that was supposed to be out out in front of everybody. So that's just another one of those things the Supreme Court did. I mean, the first 
The first thing they had to do was basically remove God from the highest authority in this nation. That's what they did in the early 60s with separation of church and state, kicking God and the Bible and prayer and everything out of school. Uh, basically, they fulfilled what it says in, in Psalms chapter 2, where it says, let the kings of the earth uh, say, let, let us cut their bonds from us. Um, and and that's, that's exactly what's happened. It's basically the government, as I said, God, government citizens. It's the government coming out from under the authority of God, no longer publicly recognizing that they are basically placed there by God. And that's what it says in Romans 1 through 4, that every power that exists in, or is, exists of God, that God put people there. Um, consider Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, we only have to look at American government. We can look at Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was put into power by God. He, I mean, Daniel told him that on several occasions. Um, and then one time near the end of Nebuchadnezzar's life, you know, he, he walked around the palace and said, hey, look at all this kingdom that I built for myself. And, then, and God was like, OK, you, you forgot the important lesson. He had to go go out in the field and eat grass for seven years um, until he came to his senses. And when he came back, what did he say? Hey, hey, I'm second in the chain of command. There's somebody that outranks me. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. He does what he wants, when he wants, <laughs> where he wants, to who he wants. Um, so Nebuchadnezzar gets a bit of a bad rap because of the, the three Hebrew uh, men story. But if you look at Nebuchadnezzar's life, he was actually straightened out by the time he hit the end of his life. He, he came to his senses. Right. He finally came around. The king of Assyria, not so much. Yeah, yeah. And they have and a whole, and a whole lot of others. Pharaoh. So the people that go through your course, what do you encourage them to do in their personal lives to affect change? Well, I mean, we have to understand that we're supposed to be the salt and the light. That's one of the greatest commandments and, and uh, you know, directives by Christ himself. You have to understand, and my problem is, is what Charles Finney said. Charles Finney said, if there's immorality in the land, it's the, it's the, it's the pulpit's fault. All right. It's not the spiritually blind people. It's not the people who have not had their eyes open. It's it's the fault of the church. When the church is not doing its job, the, the nation falls into decay. And that's what that's what salt and light is. Salt is a moral preserve is a preservative. Um, you know, I live in I live in hunting country. If you go out and you shoot a deer and you hang it up in the tree and three or four days later, it's rotten. It's not the deer's fault. You didn't shoot a bad deer. Um, that's just the natural. That's just the natural process of decay. Um, if it's rotten, it's because the person that shot it either didn't put salt on it, which was all you had back in Christ's day, or you didn't refrigerate it. You didn't slow the decay. Um, and that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be really the moral preservative of the nation. And then the same with light. I put this in my first book. There's no such thing as a dark switch. You know, you can't you can't go in and turn on or off the dark. The uh, Darkness is just the absence of light. So if, if there's darkness prevailing in our land, and that's what Charles Finney said, if there's darkness in our land, it's because the light's not getting outside the four walls of the church and being the light. And, and that's what we're afraid of. We're afraid of the name calling. We're afraid of being called, labeled a bunch of different things. You know what? You just got to accept that because Christ told you that's what was going to happen. I mean, over, over and over again. I mean, Christ said the world hates me because I testify that it's that its deeds are evil. If, if you're out there in society and you're testifying this is evil, this is evil, this is evil, the people committing those acts are going are, are going to hate you, and they're going to say all kinds of things about you. You just have to resign yourself to that fact and understand. You know, I'm not working for you. I'm working for somebody a little higher than you. Reminded of a verse that I read just recently. I think it's at the maybe chapter 3 of Leviticus, it's really early on in Leviticus, it says that every single meat sacrifice that they offered had to be seasoned with salt. Yeah, very good point. Absolutely. There's a reason that God put all that all that stuff in there. So if you just apply those things and understand, you know, the, the, the problem can primarily be traced right back to the church. And that's why I started Peacemakers Outreach. Um, that's why I started my, that's why I wrote my Appeal to Heaven book, um, Martin Luther King said, if all we do is sit inside the four walls of the church, we become nothing more than an ineffective social club. And a lot of churches are having about as much impact on their nation and their country um, as, as the Lions Club or the Moose Lodge or anybody else. They're having very no, no impact. You know, we, we come together and we eat our coffee and donuts and we hear a couple stories and then we leave. And that's about the extent of our Christianity for the next six days. Um, and that, that needs to end. Christianity is supposed to be a training ground. You're supposed to come in and find out what God wants you to do, and then you go out the next six days and do it. And, and that's that's the disconnect that we're missing. Yeah, and it's so interesting that what would a sacrifice without salt look like? So if, if the pulpit is the one that's offering sacrifices, sacrifice of worship, 
and you do it without salt, that's actually an abomination to God. If you preach a sermon that is not meant to preserve the culture, God actually sees that as a negative thing, and he wishes that you would just stop preaching at all. That was the message in in Isaiah. I think the beginning of Isaiah, God says, please stop offering sacrifices to me. They stink because you're not cleaning up your act. I'd rather you didn't offer sacrifices at all than offer me bad sacrifices. That's exactly right. And that's one of the major problems. I think you nailed it on the head right there. We've become so much of a New Testament church. People do not read the Old Testament. Uh, I'll tell you what. I, I mean, I spent probably the first... I don't know, five years of my life just reading through the New Testament about 15 times. But it wasn't until I went to Bible college and I was forced to read the Old Testament that I was like, well, wait a minute here. There's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of truths that I'm kind of missing here. And that that's what we have to understand. There, there are so many truths in the Old Testament that really go forward into the New. They carry over into the New Testament. Matter of fact, you can't even understand a lot of New Testament scriptures without having the foundational understanding of the Old Testament especially the book of Hebrews. I don't know how many times the book of Hebrews goes back and just quotes the Old Testament over and over and over again. Well, you can't understand, you know, you can't even understand when Jesus said, remember Lot's wife, if you don't understand what the story was there. Yep. And in Revelation, it says we're kingly priests. Well, what in the world is a priest and what do they do? And what was the role of a king? And what were the laws for a king? You know, a king can't uh, have many wives. He can't have many horses and he can't he can't acquire excessive riches for himself and to say that, well, those things don't apply anymore. And we're just really seeing all the results of those types of things, those types of actions and sins today work themselves out. Hey, you had, you had a very good point. I wasn't planning on touching on, but um, that's what it says. It says it over several times through the new Testament that we are both Kings and priests. Um, And and what, what has happened in Christianity and and what it encourages me um, is that the Protestant Reformation, the priesthood of the believer was restored, that we don't need somebody interceding for us. We can go boldly to the throne of grace on our own. What I believe that we're starting to see right now is the restoration of the king, because um, both the king priest, because uh, Mechizedek was a king priest, uh, King David was a king and a priest, Jesus was a king and a priest. That's what we as believers are supposed to be, both priests and kings. So we're supposed to offer up sacrifices, yes, but we're also supposed to rule and reign with Christ. So when you read the end times and it says, you know, when Christ comes back and rules for a thousand years, it says we are going to rule and reign with Christ. Well, in order for you to be qualified to rule and reign with Christ, you have to understand first that that divine chain of command, God, government, citizens. You know, I'm just basically a manager of his business. I'm a steward of his kingdom. So if you think you can run off and just run that business any way you want <laughs> without his approval, you're probably not going to be qualified for the position. So that that's what I see happening right now. I see the the restoration of, of the king, and I believe that, that that is going to happen before Christ returns, is the Christian church is going to understand its function as the church, as the ecclesia, um, as basically, it's, it's the thus saith the Lord. We've lost that in the church for whatever reason. You know, because we make this about my opinion, your opinion on whatever issue you're talking about, you know, and it's no, this is what God has said, period. (laughs) If you don't like it, take it up with him. Yeah, there's going back to the other things that you really can't understand when I think it's in first or second Peter that says that we're living stones of the temple. Well, yeah, what what in the world does that mean? Um, And also, you mentioned that David was a priest. I, I was under the impression that he wasn't. So I'll have to go back and look at that. He would sit right in the Holy of Holies and in, in right in God's presence. It's a, I think there's a study, I can't remember, it's from Bible college, so we're talking, you know, 15 years ago. I think it's Kevin J. Connor has, has some very good books um, on David and on the temples and on the different, uh, it starts with the Tabernacle of Moses and then it goes to the Temple of, uh, uh, well, actually, yeah, it starts with Moses and then it goes to David and then it goes to Solomon as the temple evolved and grew. Um, that's a wonderful study in and of itself. There's a picture of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, because he gives him the law two times. The first time he gives him the law, God writes it down, Moses takes it down the mountain and breaks the Ten Commandments. The second time, uh, he breaks him, He breaks the Ten Commandments because he sees Israel's sin. So he goes back up the mountain, and God gives him the same commandments, but he says, this time, Moses, you're going to write them. I'm not going to write them down for you. I'm going to speak them to you. I'm going to give you my word. And then you're going to take that law and you're going to put it into the heart of the temple, which is a picture of God, of us, God united with his church. And so the difference isn't 
well, in the new covenant, there is no law. It's no, it's the same law. It's where does that law live? Does it get broken or does it stay in your heart and give you new life? Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's the perfect example of that. It, I mean, even in the Old Testament, it said, it says, I will place my laws within your heart and then you will do them. It doesn't say that's the that's the 12th lie in that Americanism course is that we no longer have to keep God's uh, moral law. And there's a couple scriptures that they use. To, and that's the biggest problem in the church today is they're so ignorant of the fact of what laws carried over from the Old Testament uh, and, and and what did not. Because uh, they see, you know, they, they see Jesus saying, hey, the woman doesn't require to get stoned, so it's okay for her to commit adultery. No, he told her, go and sin no more. <laughs> God, you know, in the Old Testament, there were three types of laws. There was the, uh, the moral law, which was represented by the Ten Commandments. Uh, there was the civil law, which was, um, if you do it, here's the penalty. And then there's the sacrificial law, washing of hands and sacrifices when we transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the civil law has been done away with, the ceremonial law has been done away with. We don't have to make sacrifices. We don't have to wash our hands or keep feast days or any of these other things. Um, but nowhere in the New Testament will you find one scripture anywhere where where the moral law has been has been discarded. Even Jesus said, I have not come to do away with the law. I've come to fulfill it. So, I mean, look look at any example where somebody's, you know, committing adultery or I mean, read read First Corinthians five, where the guys had his father's mother. He didn't say, "Hey, we're not under the law anymore. Leave him alone." Um, it says we're not supposed to lie, we're not supposed to steal, we're not supposed to worship false idols, um, we're not supposed to take the Lord's name in vain. I mean, the New Testament's very clear. Uh, other than twisting, I think it's Romans six fourteen. We're not under the law, but under grace. I mean, they they twist that one so bad that you know, hey, we don't have to keep God's law anymore because we're under grace. Well, that's. That's false grace. That That is an interpretation of false grace according to Jude 4, because he says ungodly men have creeped into the church unaware, turning the grace of God into a license for immorality. And that's exactly what the false message, the heretical message has been from the very beginning, is when people say, hey, we're under, we're under grace. When, when I got saved, um, and again, I came out of a rock and roll bar lifestyle, drugs, alcohol, women, the whole nine yards. Um, and I wrestled with this whole idea of, of grace when I was in Bible college and what the real meaning of it was. Um, and I went in and talked to my pastor and, and sat down with him. And I said, you mean to tell me that if I was to go back tonight and to do everything that I did before I got saved, it would be OK. And, and he sat down and he wrote a stick man and he put an umbrella over it. And he wrote the word grace in it and said, God doesn't see your sin because you're under grace. Well, that was the last time I stepped foot in that church. So. Um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, prominent teaching uh, in, in Christianity today is this false grace message that you can be, pretty much do whatever you want and it's okay with God. No, that, the, the church is broken. The church needs to get fixed first. Um, there's a whole lot of false doctrine out there. I mean, just like Paul said, we've been infiltrated from without and within from wolves. There are, there are um, uh, I think it was Paul that, that said that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Therefore, it's no big deal that his ministers masquerade as ministers of righteousness. The, the church first has to fix itself. Before we can go out there and try to fix the world, the church has to, to fix itself and get itself straight. Um, and then and that's what Jesus said. You know, get the beam out of your, get the beam out of your own eyes so you can cl see clearly to get it out of everybody else. So I think that's one of our, one of our, one of our first uh, issues that we have to deal with is just uh getting our theology straight, um, exposing those who are, who are false, who are plants. I just had to do that last week here very, in a very public, <laughs> a very public way. Um, but yeah, that, that would solve a lot of our problems. So John, somebody comes up to you and they say, okay, I like all this stuff. I'd like where you're coming from. I understand. And I agree with you, but either my pastor won't see kindly to this, or maybe it's a pastor who's saying that I think that a lot of my congregation would leave or I might face some pretty severe persecution and be shut down to where I wouldn't be able to speak anymore. What would you say to somebody who's who's fearful? Fears of the devil, plain and simple. I mean, the key the key to Christianity is this, and I just I mean, I, you can sum up most of Christianity um, uh, on Paul's road to Damascus. What did he say? First two questions: Who are you, Lord, and what would you have me do? Those are the most two important prayers that any believer can ask of God. Who are you? getting to understand his nature, his character, who he is, what he likes, what he doesn't like, and then what would you have me do? Okay, you created me, you put me here, um, I'm here to serve you. And, and too many times, in and we all do it, 
I mean, because it's just part of our human nature that, that, you know, we want God to do our bidding rather than we are surrendered to doing God's bidding. And you can find that in Romans 12, where it says, you talked about sacrifices, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Well, how do you apply that? Well, basically, and I remember when God was calling me to do this myself, and I didn't do it, and I didn't want to do it for about three months, but it basically comes down to this. Whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, wherever you want me to say, even unto death, I will follow you. I mean, you pray that prayer right there. You have just went from making Jesus Savior to making him Lord. And a vast majority of the church just wants that fire insurance. They just want, I want to be saved, but I don't want him to touch my life. I don't want to change. I don't, he may send me to Mozambique or he may <laughs> call me to go talk to somebody. You know, you have to just totally surrender your life to Christ. And that's what Jesus said. If you do not, you're not worthy of me. And he said that several times throughout the gospel. So um, I would just challenge anybody listening, and, and, and the Holy Spirit leads you to this. You really don't even need me to, to say it. He uses you to bring up response to the Holy Spirit in somebody. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly, that's exactly, and I didn't need anybody to tell me that. I just knew within my heart and in my spirit that that's, that prayer of surrender is what is what God was calling me to do, is just to make him, you know, get out of the pilot seat and let him be the pilot and you be the co-pilot. And, and that, that's a very hard thing for people to do. Um, because again, they, they get fearful. Just, just the whole conversation started off on fear. Um, they're fearful of what God will call them to do, where he'll send them. I mean, you know what? He's a little bit smarter than you. So, I mean, fortunately for me, I went 27 years without Christ and I made my life an absolute train wreck. <laughs> so I finally got to the realization, you know what? I think someone's a little smarter than me. Maybe if I just do what he says to do, my life will be blessed and be a little better. Um, and that applies as a nation as much as an individual. Look at Deuteronomy 28. He gave the law. You know, he listed 15 ways you would be blessed. And then he turned around and said, here's 45 areas that you're going to be cursed if you don't. So that applies to an individual and it also applies to a nation. So first I had to apply it to myself as an individual. And then when I understood the basic principle that a nation is just made up of a whole bunch of people, if everybody's living that life, then you're going to have a nation that's blessed because everybody's obeying God's commandments. Amen. Amen. Well, John, I'm so encouraged. Uh, you you didn't get the earliest start in life, but that's not an excuse. You've really taken these things and, and run with them. And who knows how much longer that, that God has left for us to minister. So I'm, I'm very encouraged and uh, glad to talk to you, brother. Amen. Appreciate that. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, it, God, God can start with you at 80 years old. It doesn't matter. He knew the time and the season that, that he was going to call you and he knew what he's, he's called you to do. You know, one of the things that a pastor told me when I was young, and it took me a long time to really grasp this, but you sow when you're young and you reap when you're old. A lot of times God will put a vision or something in your heart when you're young and we think it's going to happen in the next week or two weeks or two years. Typically, no, <laughs> typically it's about 30, 40 years before the promises of God are actually manifested in your life. It, that was a seed. And, you know, I mean, a, a tree doesn't grow overnight. So you look a lot of the promises gave to David, uh, Abraham, I mean, a whole lot of people. Um, the promise came very early and it wasn't fulfilled till much later in their life. So, John, how can people find you online to learn more? What's the best way for them to either get in touch with you or find more about everything that you're saying? The two biggest things we're doing right now is my organization is called Peacemakers Outreach, um, and you can go to peacemakersoutreach.com. Uh, that's It's a parachurch organization. It's kind of set up like Focus on the Family or Answers in Genesis. It's not a church, but it's an educational uh, kind of outreach. Um, and then the first project that we're working on is is what I call the Appeal to Heaven. And that's the one that's getting me a lot of uh, radio interviews. That's getting me a lot of speaking engagements at conferences right now. Uh, it's appealingtoheaven.org. And that's the book that I have written. It's really, it's kind of su subtitled a, a Cry for Divine Justice. And it's about um, restoring government. God created every institution there is, and he created government. And there's a divine order. There, there's a very specific, you can go back to Israel and look at it, or you can look at Romans 13. God has created a very, very, what I call the universal chain of command, God, government, citizen. And if we stay in that, that then we are one nation under God. All right, it's, it's when the government rebels or man rebels, that's when things start to go haywire, and that's where you have that conflict. But when everybody, and that's kind of what America was really from the beginning, is everybody recognized and understood the creator that, is, that he gave us his, our rights, 
Um, and when we were still operating on that for about the first 340 years, we didn't have any of the political turmoil that we had today. And the, and the one time that we did was basically slavery because we couldn't agree on whether slavery was biblical or not. Well, we agree now. Nobody, nobody's still using the Bible to justify that. But we're starting to run into the same situation again here over a lot of other moral issues, uh, abortion and, 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 and gay marriage and a whole lot of other things. So um, in my book, I've got what they call the historical cycle of the world's civilizations. You know, it just it repeats itself over and over and over and over again. And we're right back into that. We're right back into that cycle again where it's going to take faith and courage to turn this nation back around. Thanks, John. It's been great talking to you.